Barbara Piet is a member of the CLF Board of Directors and is joining us from Cambridge, Massachusetts, where she's a managing partner of Knightsbridge Advisors, a venture capital fund of funds. Barbara also serves on the board of a public bank and is an advisor to several early stage venture capital funds. I first met, welcome Barbara, <laughs> see you now. I first met Barbara when she reached out for help with her daughter, Esther Lovett. Now Esther is a competitive soccer player, suffered her first serious concussion in eighth grade and struggled with PCS for about two and a half years before suffering another concussion right before her junior year of high school. Esther has used her experience to become an advocate for other kids struggling with PCS. She's interned with us at CLF. She has a blog and, and her own website. She's spoken public, publicly about her experience in interviews and even on stage. She's done a TED talk. Uh, you know, she's really one of those wonderful, hopeful stories uh, that you find in this PCS world where, uh, you know, a very, she went through a very tough time, was very much helped by her mother and her parents, and is now doing very well and is paying it forward by trying to help others who've been through the same thing. She's now finishing up her sophomore year at Georgetown, doing so much better, but she's been through a lot. So we're excited to welcome her mother to share with us what she's learned from the parents' perspective. So Barbara, thank you so much for joining. Thanks for having me, Chris. So we had a little discussion in advance and you know you you have you've learned so much and let's start at the beginning when it becomes clear your child's suffering longer than the usual recovery from concussion um, there's a large variety of symptoms in play most of which are invisible many that can be perceived as something else what's your advice to parents who think that their child you know, they're not sure what's happening and they're not sure if what they're seeing is really due to the concussion or due to something else. Yeah, so I, I think my the, the first piece of advice is you know your child and you know what your child's behavior has been previously. You know what kind of student they've been. So believe in your child, trust your child. Um, I've talked to so many parents through CLF and, and through networking with friends over the years. And I hear parents who say, they think that their child may be in with the wrong friends or they think their child may not like school anymore or they don't understand why their child got lazy or they don't understand why their child is being rude and wearing sunglasses in the kitchen when it's sunny. And I tell all those parents, please just believe in your kid. You know your child and you know what they were capable of. You know their motivation. And so please, they need you to believe in them because there'll be coaches who won't believe them. There'll be school administrators who won't believe them. There'll be teachers who don't get it at all. You know your child and you've got to be the first uh, level advocate for them. Yeah, and, and was that buy-in immediate for you or, or did you have any questions in your head as, as it sort of happened? I, I think there were always moments of doubt, but I never really wavered because I, I was very close to my daughter Esther and I knew I knew her motivation. I knew how hard a worker she was. And so, um, and I could tell, I could tell when she had a headache. You know, I could tell by how white her face was. I could tell by the look in her eyes. Um, you just you just see this look where they get a little glassy eyed and a little bit pale. Um, and I would always know when she had a headache. And so um, I just never doubted it. And I saw how hard she worked and how it would yeah. take her so much longer to do her schoolwork. And this was a kid that had a razor sharp memory and could get through her homework quickly, who now was taking so much longer to process. Um, I watched her struggle to give, you know, after her very first concussion when she didn't really realize what she was dealing with, nor did I, um, I helped her go back to school because she felt like she had to give a, um, a, a talk and she didn't want to let her team down. And um, he, she, um, she forced herself to go give this talk. And once she got up on stage, I realized, oh my gosh, this is so bad. She was literally shaking um, yeah. and not from nerves. She was a great public speaker, but, but just from the fatigue and the, and the headache itself. So wow. watch your kid and, and you know, listen to their symptoms. Yeah, and you can imagine how important that would be for a young child because the world does question you. So if your parents are questioning you too, 
yeah. can, you're right, can be really isolating. So, you know, and Esther is a special case. You know, she's a great athlete, a dedicated student. She was also the youngest of all, uh, child of all of our parents when she was hurt. Um, so her, her concussions forced her to change her life at a young age. Can you explain, you know, what that was like for her, the, what you called a series of losses and then how you helped her cope? Yeah, so it was a combination of, um, of losses and then the self-identity piece. So my daughter was an athlete. She'd been an athlete, you know, her self-image was that of an athlete from the time she was a little girl. She was playing soccer at age three and a half, I think. Um, she played tennis. She was playing hockey when she was little. And she was never one of those girls that was interested in, you know, playing dress up and all that kind of stuff. She always had a ball or a stick. And, and that was who she was, and it was year-round sports. And so, you know, initially when she was hurt at the end of eighth grade, it was all about when can I go back, when can I go back? And, um, you know, her physicians kept saying, wait until you're not symptomatic. And it really took a, a long time to realize that she probably wasn't going back. And, and then what do you do when your entire self-definition, I mean, she was, a, she was a good student um, mm -hmm. and she felt like she wasn't as good at that anymore. And she was an athlete, that's who she was. Her friend group or her teams, um, her mentors were her coaches. And you start losing all those people in your life that are so important. And what really hit me a few months in was the series of losses, the loss of who you are or how you self-identify the loss of all these people in your life. You know, one of her, her coaches was the best mentor she had ever had. And so you've got to really help your child grieve. I mean, there really are a series of losses. Um, and how do you help your child when the school nurse, you know, doesn't believe that there's such a thing as PCS? Um, and, and so the loss of feeling like, you know, my, my daughter felt like I'm a person of integrity. I've never lied to anybody in my life. How can my school not believe me? Um, and those are all losses. And so you're, you're helping your child with, with grief. Um, one of the things that got Esther and I through that period was um, we used to walk the dog together every night, rain or shine, blizzard or not, we walked the dog. That was our thing. And it was on those walks in the dark, um, you know, when she would just feel most free to just talk and talk about her feelings and what she was going through. And that was, um, I think, cathartic for her and really let me in on the window of what her world was like. And then you have to, part of that grief is then, then what? Um, you know, mm -hmm. you, you have to reinvent yourself. And how does a 13 year old or a 15 year old reinvent herself when her whole world has been sports? Um, and, you know, you get all kinds of advice from people. A lot of the advice was, oh, go be a team manager. Well, you know, at her school, being a team manager meant sitting there with a clipboard and making a few notes. And that's not who she was. I mean, you know, she was a, she was a player, not a, not a sidelines person. And so she, as she tells it, she had to find a new team. And so she threw herself into something completely different and started writing for the school year, uh, the school newspaper. And, um, worked her way into an editor role and that was that was a long way from sports on on the one hand on the other hand there was this adrenaline rush going to print every you know couple of weeks yeah. when the paper was published there was this uh camaraderie of working together with a group to select what articles they were going to write and to divvy it up and to chip in and help each other and so that made her feel like she was part of a team and part of something meaningful and something that mattered again and that really, I think, changed everything. And then her advocacy work was, was part of that reinvention. And at some point in her life, um, and I hope she doesn't listen to this because she'll get embarrassed if I say it, but um, she, at one point in her life, she just said, look, I, I can either be a victim to this or I can be a warrior and I'm gonna fight. And so that's what she decided to do. She decided to fight for other people. Yes, she did. So how about that moment about deciding that you're just never going back to soccer? You know, how did you and your husband support that decision and, and how have you learned to walk the line in terms of taking future risks with new activities? Oh, that's a hard one. So, so two parts to that. Um, Esther would say that one of the things that helped her the most was 
I, I didn't, I'm sorry to admit this to you, Chris, but I, I didn't much care about sports one way or the other. I was the one who focused on the academics, right? My husband cared a lot about, about sports and Esther knew that her father cared about sports. And I think one of the reasons she played hockey in addition to soccer was that hockey mattered a lot to him. And the way Esther tells it, Rick never for one second made her feel guilty or regretful that she couldn't play. And the way he approached it was, okay, I'm a fan and um, you know, I can't play anymore either because I'm an old guy now. And so Esther's just gonna be a fan with me. And so they just really embraced watching sports together. And you know what a great, you know, what a football fan she is. And they just really got into watching baseball and, and football together. And he never made her feel guilty for an instant. And that really helped. And I've talked to a lot of parents who can't let go because it's part of the parent self identity to be a, you know, a coach for those for the kids team or to to want to be there on the sideline rooting for their child. And, you know, you you go through some losses as a parent too. Yeah, and it's, but and that's a good lead to our next question because it's often hard to know when to actually step away. And so one of the things that you guys did is was you were as you were trying to take care of her symptoms, you had to go out and find doctors. And, you're, and this happened a while ago before we even had the clinics that we have today. So how did you go about sort of finding that team of specialists? Uh, and how important was it for, for her to hear from multiple doctors to, to help make those decisions? Yeah, I have to say that piece was so hard. And Chris, this is something that you help with so much now with your website. Um, you know, it's it's so many physicians don't understand concussion. We were really lucky because initially we were seen, she was seen at Boston Children's Hospital um, and, and they have a good concussion clinic there. And then through you, we met Dr. Cantu, which was, was, was uh, you know, a fabulous transition for her as she got older and a lifesaver. Um, but finding all those other people, you know, you really need a team and finding a good physician is a, is a big piece of that. Um, but you can't do it alone as a parent. And there's all these, it's an art, not a science, right? There's no cure. This isn't an ACL tear where, you, you know, there's a set of things you do and then you're done. Um, and, and, you know, we tried everything. We tried, um, we tried uh, if, uh, feedback, uh, biofeedback. We tried acupuncture. Um, she saw a couple of different physical therapists. And so it was a real hit or miss trying to find the right people and people who were experts. And, um, you know, at the end of the day, I think she was most helped by a cognitive behavioral therapist who um, is not really a therapist, that kind of a therapist, but who helped her with her memory. Mm -hmm. And her memory was something that was, it was bothered her self-esteem a lot because she used to have a fabulous memory. And she learned a whole bunch of new tricks for redeveloping her memory and recapturing that crisp memory. Um, that was enormously helpful. We found one physical therapist that really, really understood concussion and diagnosed her with, um, with an eye convergence. She was apparently seen double, um, unusually far out, which nobody caught for a right. year, which I didn't even realize. And so part of the trouble with seeing the board in school and having such tremendous headaches at school was that she was seeing double at a distance and couldn't focus from that, you know, looking at the board and then looking down to right. Um, so, so it was a very slow, painful, iterative process. Um, and as the parent, you've got to be the advocate. You've got to try to network like crazy to find these right um, people to, to help your kid. Right. There's no single treatment that's ever going to fix everybody. And it's important to keep trying, right? Exactly. So last couple sections, you know, one of them is this also affects parents, right? This isn't just happening to the, your child. And so when did you realize it was important for you and your husband to have a support system? And what did you learn about uh, who you could open up to? Boy, you know, that's a really good question. That was a very hard piece for me because um, my closest friends were parents at the same school as my kids and their kids knew my kids really well. And, you know, there's, there's certain things that your child is coping with and going through that their business, it's not yours to share with people who know them too. So mm -hmm. trying to find, you know, people that are, understand what it's like to be a parent 
who don't really know your kid's friends um, was, it was, a, was a hard piece of that. And you do need support as a parent. And I would really advise parents to make sure that they're talking about it because they're dealing with a series of losses too. Um, and, and, and need to vent about how terrible the healthcare system is and how hard it is to find the right people and, and all that. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's, it's important and it's important to, um, to stay, I guess, on top of it and not to be always so invested in solely giving that you don't take care of yourself because you need to take care of yourself because your kid needs you. Yeah. And then the last uh, question is, you know, this is such a tough injury to navigate and, you know, it's easy to feel like you might be failing your child because they, they aren't getting better as fast as you want them to, you know, so what's your final message to parents about that? So um, my, my daughter actually gives me this advice all the time. You know, I constantly say if only we had found this physical therapist, you know, two years ago, or if only I had known, or if only I hadn't let you go back to school so early, or if only I had not let you, you know, finish up those last papers that you were just desperate to put it, finish up. And my daughter just reminds me that we just didn't know. And that this, again, this isn't, a, this is a long, painful syndrome it's complicated and unraveling all that is hard and you can't beat yourself up. And it's not that you didn't go get the right recipe book. You know, it's just, um, it, a lot of it is trial and error. And so, you know, just be grateful when you find the right person and be grateful when you figure something out and don't go back and beat yourself up for what you didn't do at the time. Yeah, that's a, that's a great message for parents. Any last thoughts? Yeah, I mean, the, the one thing I, I, would, I would say is it's really important to make sure that not only that you're not trying to do it all alone in the care of your child, you know, you know you're the principal advocate, but you need other advocates. So you need to find somebody at school who gets it, hopefully somebody in the administration, hopefully a teacher, um, somebody else who understands what your child is going through. I will forever love the neuropsych tester that Esther had to go see, who um, used to tell Esther, it's not an IQ problem. <laughs> you know, you're <laughs> as smart as you ever were. Um, and I will remember that guy forever for, for saying that a bunch of times to her. Um, but, but also you, Chris, when she got that second concussion and, you know, we, it was like Sisyphus pu pushing the rock up the hill, right? And she was almost at the top of the hill when she got that second major concussion. And I felt like, I don't even know what to say to her. And, 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 and you came in and told her that you'd been there and that you know it was a setback, but she was, she was gonna be all right. And that made a huge difference. And so I think you've gotta get some other perspectives and not feel like you've always gotta be the only person there.